for all of us. It's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Joe Mendizi, who's the founder of Bitter and the editor-in-chief of Media Post. Now, Bitter is a new marketplace where people can trade their time with brands that offer the best value for it, really making explicit the value exchange that happens between a potential consumer or a consumer and a brand itself. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the interview. Joe's also daytime job is editor-in-chief of Media Post, which is a publisher of news and information servicing, advertising, media, marketing, and technology industries. He oversees that organization of writers, editors, designers, tech professionals, supporting more than 50 discrete publications and distributed via digital and analog media. He's been in this business for 39 years and starting out as a journalist in 1979 with Adweek. This conversation covers a lot of different topics. We spend quite a bit of time on Cambridge Analytica, which is obviously in the news, and Facebook with its privacy, the value of data, how his new organization Bitter is capitalizing on that trend of, of giving people control of their personal sovereignty, and many, many other topics. I think you're going to enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Joe Mandizi. I'm definitely going to have Joe back on the show at some point in the future. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Joe Mendizi. Well, Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alan. It's a pleasure to be with you. So you're the editor-in-chief of Media Post and a founder of a new company, Bitter. We'll get to Bitter in a little bit, but you've been you know, covering this industry of marketing, advertising, and media for, I think, 39 years. Is that right? Yes. Thanks for reminding me. But... <laughs> Well, it's a long period of time. I won't say a great long period of time, but a long period of time. You know, what's kept you focused on that space for so long? Well, I never get bored. The ad industry and the media industry and the technology it's spawning is literally an industrial revolution. If you think about it, when I started covering advertising and media, it was in the early 1980s, just at the start of the multi-channel revolution, pre-digital. And it's only gotten crazier, more interesting and intense every year since. When I started covering advertising and media in literally in the early 80s, there were only 200 brands using national TV. By the end of the 80s, because of cable and satellite, there were over 4,000 brands using national TV. And today, thanks to companies like Google and Facebook, there are over 5 million brands in the world. And that's just the revolution of the number of brands that have been created. When you look at all the different media technologies that enable consumers to interact, or more importantly, avoid advertising and branding, it's a really exciting time. There's a lot of tension and conflict, a lot of disruption, but anything's possible. If you think about it, Media Post now covers things like artificial intelligence, augmented reality, internet of things. We're writing about self-driving cars and what the brand implications are of that. So it's like I was a geek growing up on science fiction in the 70s, and literally every author I ever read back then, like Philip K. Dick, all that stuff's coming true today. So the thing that keeps me going is I never know what's going to hit my inbox today and what I'll be writing about by the end of the day. What have you learned about the evolution of the industry itself? It's so different now than I imagine when, it, when you started. Yeah, it's really different. I mean, I think there's one key insight I've picked up on. I've heard it from different people in the industry, and it's, it's informed my thesis. And the first time I really heard it articulated well was from Nigel Morris, who was the CEO of Aegis Media, part of uh, Denso Aegis. And this was maybe almost 10 years ago. but Nigel was talking to some securities analysts on a call explaining the advertising marketplace. And they asked him why things were so crazy and confusing and messed up. And Nigel, in a very effective British accent, very laid back, said, it's because we've moved from an era of information scarcity to one of ubiquity. But if you think about what that is, it's really true. When advertising first evolved in, well, 1700s or the 1800s, certainly up until the modern post-World War II era, there was a relative scarcity of media available for the average consumer. We had three television networks, a few radio stations, a number of newspapers, but there were only so many ways to acquire someone's attention through advertising and media. But if you think about what's happened, starting with that multi-channel revolution in the 80s, on through the digital revolution, is we have an infinite amount of information available to us. 
So that creates a real challenge for brands who want to communicate with you because they're no longer allocating a scarcity of information that you want to acquire as a consumer. They're actually competing for a scarcity of your attention that's available among split among all these different choices. So the biggest challenge and the biggest thing I've learned about advertising media over time is that the proliferation of media gives people more choice to control which media they pay attention to. So the key insight there is advertising was based on a simple borrowed interest model where they sponsored or underwrote the cost of media. And that was a fair value exchange, right? You couldn't literally turn a channel. I mean, you had to get up manually and turn it until the remote control came along and then the VCR and then a DVR. But if you think about where we are today with ad blockers and, you know, increasingly media that consumers subscribe to that don't even have advertising in them like Netflix or Amazon or Hulu, it's a real threat an existential threat to advertising and media. So the solution now, of course, is that brands have to be even more engaging. The main way they're trying to execute that is through big ideas and creativity, but increasingly through content. Now, the problem there is there's also an infinite amount of content in the world. So brands are competing with every movie, YouTube video, cat, (laughs) baby video, you name it. So it's really a paradox of choice. That's the biggest thing I've learned. Interesting. So the industry's changed a ton. What do you think the biggest challenges ahead are going to be? Well, for brand marketers and agencies, I think understanding the world they actually exist in. I think if you take what I just explained about the fragmentation and the proliferation of choice, I think the real problem is that most brands still think they operate in a category of immediate competitors. They don't realize they're competing with an infinite number of options for the consumer's attention. You know, it's funny, just recently, one of our sales guys at Media Post was talking about a meeting they had with a big publisher, I think it was the New York Times. And they said their biggest competition wasn't Business Insider or the Wall Street Journal, it was Netflix. And they meant that in two ways. One was that literally Netflix competes for attention and time that the consumer could be spending reading the New York Times. But the other way is they're literally making a decision on a subscription price. Do I wanna pay for the New York Times or for Netflix? I think that's a really interesting anecdote, but when you think about it in the scheme of all brands, I don't think a brand, even in a specific category like automotive or packaged goods, can think about their immediate competitors anymore and the amount of time and attention they compete for those consumers in that market share. They have to think about a realistic world in which consumers have millions and millions of options, literally. So I think I explained earlier that the number of brands in the world is over 5 million. And it really comes down to how you define a brand. So there's an interesting piece of research that the ad agency Havas has tracked over the last 10 years. They call it the Meaningful Brand Study. And I think it's a very insightful piece of research. What they've done is they've asked consumers around the world, a big panel, tens of thousands, a very essential question, which is if this brand went away tomorrow, Would it matter to you? Would it change your life? How indispensable is that brand to you? And on a global basis, about 72% of brands could disappear tomorrow and the average consumer wouldn't care less. In the United States, it's more like 92%. And the reason for that is we have so much brand choice in the United States. So that seems like a real problem, right? Only 8% of brands matter enough to the average consumer here that they'd even care if they were here tomorrow. It's also a tremendous opportunity because in that 8%, there's a lot of choice and consideration. And also, if you use long tail principles, as described by Chris Anderson in his great book, doesn't mean everybody has the same brands in that 8% consideration. So you could have mass reach brands like a Coca-Cola or a Google that almost everybody uses, but then you have very discreet or particular brands that some people use and others don't. But it's a real problem. And brands need to understand they're no longer operating in a world of category competition. They're competing in a world of infinite competition. That's a very good point. It's a very good point. The other thing that's been evolving are the players. Uh, You've got traditional agencies, obviously, on the media and the creative side. And that used to not even be a separation. It used to be just agencies. (laughs) Then you've got, you know, large ones, holding companies, small ones. And now you've got the consultancies in the mix. Who do you think is going to win out in all of this? That's right. Just like there's an infinite number of choices in of brands in the world or an infinite number of choices of media in the world is an infinite number of choices of marketing services in the world. And they keep proliferating because the more channels that are available, the more complicated and confusing the world gets, the more solutions you need. I think the real story there isn't who's going to win in terms of consolidation. The real story is that who's winning in terms of fragmentation. 
Because the truth is, we no longer have a world in which uh, most marketers use a whole egg strategy like a YNR or a J. Walter Thompson. They're using a multitude of marketing services providers. Now, we might not think of them that way. It, we might think of them as an ad tech or a platform, but Google and Facebook are providing marketing services directly to brands. In fact, a lot of brands don't have agencies and do it self-serve through Google AdWords or Facebook custom audiences or what have you. You know, again, it comes down to how do you define a brand? Is a small business a brand? Well, if a small business can market to millions of consumers around the world, well, yeah, sure. So, but going back to your specific point, you know, I do think it's interesting that you have this proliferation of management consultants coming into Madison Avenue right now. I think the ones who will win are the ones who execute the best. And that comes with perspective. So I think one reason why management consultants have gained a leg up is they don't think monolithically the way some old school agencies or media shops would have thought, which is I'm in the creative business or I'm in the media buying business. They're thinking, what are the problems that the market is trying to solve and how the consumers perceive those opportunities to solve them? So they're thinking more macro, but they also have to execute. So if you see what they've been doing, well, they're acquiring agencies. I mean, we just saw this week that Accenture acquired MXM from Meredith, you know, which is an expert and specialist in kind of a form of direct marketing uh, using digital media. So I think, you know, they have to acquire and complement their services. But I think the real truth is just like there's a proliferation of media options and brand choices in the world, there's now a proliferation of marketing services choices. And it really gets down to how you define it. The biggest threat I think branch agencies should pay attention to is the fact that brands can increasingly bring it in-house, especially with programmatic technologies and data management systems. There is no longer an expertise in acquiring media or audiences because there are now technologies out there, whether it's Google or you know mid-tier, mid-stack type DMPs or DSPs or whatever acronym you want to use that allow everybody to compete on the same basis. So it really comes down to how well people use those tools. And the biggest question for a marketer is, do we want to bring that capability in-house and have a team of programmatic media buying specialists or audience targeters in-house versus using an agency? So I think the real opportunity for agencies isn't about, you know, commoditized services. It's about thinking out of the box, conducting original primary research and consumer insights that allows them to know, well, yeah, you could acquire that audience efficiently through a programmatic platform, but is that the right audience for you to be acquiring? Or are you serving in the right ad message at the right time in the right place? I think all of those things are still very much an agency's expertise. It's about coming up with the insights that inform the big ideas and executions, and then using the best technology and tools available to execute them. Well, Joe, that's pretty interesting. You know, And one thing that stuck out, you said, was it's really not about who is winning, I guess, but more who is going to win in a fragmented service landscape. You know, and so crafting what that value is that you can specifically provide, like you said, the more higher level thinking potentially, is that the right audience for you to go after? I think that's all really smart. And as we've talked about from media explosion and fragmentation to brand explosion and proliferation, it's also happened on the services side that leaves marketers and brands, brand leaders with like I would imagine just decision fatigue <laughs> yeah. at some level. Is there anyone that you think is doing it well from a client side? Well, you know, I don't want to single out individuals because I don't want to make enemies, but I, <laughs> it comes down to categories. And I think you basically have two kinds of CMOs or brand marketers, one who are entrenched established industries that are trying to grapple with these changes and fend off new disruptive agents and then new disruptive players or you know new economy type brands that are coming along and disrupting markets and it's a really tough position to be in to be an established brand that's been doing a nice business for a century or so and had a customer base and then all of a sudden a disruptive player comes along using a superior technology or interface and offers how should i say it, less friction to the consumer to do things so probably the best example in my opinion is amazon right and i think the CMO is really Jeff Bezos when you come right down to it. But he had this very astute insight, which is what if you could re use technology to remove all the friction from the consumer experience? Now, we think of them as just being a retailer, but it's more than that. They're allowing consumers to understand their basic choice of products, brands, 
yes, often cases pricing, but it's more than that. It's about allowing to understand over time using almost a quantified self approach when you go into Amazon and use their dashboard and see if you like this, you might like that. I mean, those are very simple binary approaches right now, but I think over time, Amazon is sitting on a lot of data and whether it's your product purchasing data through direct shipping or your media consumption data by using Amazon Prime, increasingly, I think Amazon will become more of a dominant platform. But I want to go to your earlier point because I think there is a principle here about fragmentation that pertains to CMOs and brand marketers themselves. I mean, I talked about the proliferation of media choice, the proliferation of brands competing for consumer attention, and the scarcity of time that consumers have to pay attention to brands. What I didn't talk about is the fragmentation taking place within marketers. So for that, I'd like to go back to an anecdote I heard around 2000, just as the internet was really kicking into high gear. And there was this brilliant man, I think he's retired from the industry now, his name was Norman LeHoulier, and he was the founder of Gray Digital or Gray Interactive. And so it was one of the first pure play digital agencies. And he was speaking at an Advertising Research Foundation conference about this problem. And here's how he started off. He said, you know, in the old days, a brand marketer had one ad agency, the whole egg, like a YNR or a JWT, and they did everything. They did the consumer research, the strategy, the media planning, the buying, the creative, the execution, the post, the measurement, and the world was happy and simple. But the problem was you had very limited number of options to reach the consumer. So he said you only had five media platforms, TV, radio, newspapers, magazines, out of home. But today, in this digital era of 2000, you had a multitude of new platforms. Obviously, the internet, we didn't really have mobile yet, but you could see the writing on the wall that digital technology was creating many, many more forms of media that could communicate with the consumer. But even beyond that, he said there was a proliferation and a fragmentation of marketing services. So he also rattled off five advertising, sales promotion, direct marketing, PR, and I'm blanking on the fifth one. But he said, if you look at where we are today in 2000, the landscape was much more fragmented. You had things like investor relations and sports marketing, event marketing, and this new thing called digital. So and what he was saying was that the number of marketing services considerations that a brand marketer had to make was proliferating too, not just the media. The problem was they had more th- agencies and marketing services providers to deal with. So instead of dealing with one whole egg ad agency like a YNR, they had to deal with a media buying specialist, a digital specialist, maybe a search marketing specialist, and go on and on and on. And if you think about where we are today, it's even more of a nightmare scenario for a CMO because they have to deal with platforms that are often doing the same thing as some of these marketing services agencies or technology providers, ad tech companies. So it's become a really confusing decision process to even understand how to manage marketing services within their companies. Then you have enterprise issues, which is the role that technology is playing, not just in marketing, but in, you know, product development, distribution, et cetera. So you have all these issues conflating and merging together. So I'd say the role of a CMO today is uh, a superhuman challenge because they have so many competing interests and stakeholders to deal with, not just the consumer, but internal ones, external supply chain ones. And they have to manage all of that. You know, it's a superhuman task. But to answer your question, who's winning and who's losing, it's easy to look at the new disruptor players. It's a challenge to look at the established players. I do think P&G is a good example of a company that's recognized this problem and said, well, our solution for now at least is not to get distracted by all the next bright, shiny things and focus on the core of our business. And when you're selling you know, detergent or soap or toilet paper to millions and millions of people, I think that is a, a smart strategy for them. The problem is over time, you know, there'll be a new Dollar Shave Club that'll come along and pick off Gillette's business, et cetera. So you really have to keep an eye on both worlds. I do think I feel more for the established brand managers and marketers, but it is a superhuman task. That's very true. You know, as the recording of this episode, you know, Facebook is in the news, along with Cambridge Analytica. Governments, I think, around the world now are are calling on Facebook representatives to come in front of them and testify or at least explain what's going on about the privacy of these 50 million accounts that were extracted by a researcher um, and then given to Cambridge Analytica at some point. What's your reaction to all of that? Well, I think it's a sensational news story because on many levels. One is that people didn't know what was going on, right? And, you know, it's something that started in, I think, around 2015, pre the election. 
people started to understand the implications of Cambridge Analytica post the election because stories came out about Steve Bannon's use of it in the Trump campaign and the association between the Mercer family. I think it really hit the fan, though, when people realized that they were doing it on the basis of Facebook personal data, 50 million users. And that story was broken through some great intrepid reporting from The Guardian and some other publications. So I think what it did is it emotionally charged people to understand, like, not only was their data being stolen without their knowledge, but it was being used against them. It was being used at a very nefarious level, I would argue unethical level, which is that it was using their unconscious information about their behaviors to retarget them with persuasive messages, or sometimes targeting your friends and family based on who you were. So I think that level of what's been described as as weaponized propaganda is a surprise to a lot of people. Obviously, it's not a huge surprise to people in the advertising media world because we understand these technologies. I mean, look, we're talking about AI right now and very advanced AIs yeah. that can actually outthink people. So, I mean, there are huge ethical discussions there, and I don't think we'll get into them in this interview, but sticking with the Cambridge Analytica story, I think what's really behind all of this is, isn't so much privacy. The reality is no human being is private today, no matter what you try and do. And here's the irony is people don't understand that there's a real trade-off between your data and the utility you want to use it for. The best example I heard was early on in this debate a few years ago when someone tried to explain if you wanted to really be completely private and anonymized, you would never be able to use a navigation app. If that app couldn't ping your ID on your device in your car, it couldn't tell you how to get from point A to point B. So the questions aren't, you know, do I want to divulge my data or my identity? Do I want to associate it with an application? The question is, how is it being used? How much control do I have over it? So I think the next big push in this discussion is awareness for sure, but it's going to be, what are the right rules of the road, no pun intended? And how much does the consumer need or should they know about how their data is being used? I think one of the surprising parts of the Cambridge Analytica story is how much they've held on to that data. I think from what I've read in the most recent reporting is they're still using it. Now they certified with Facebook uh, in 2015, I think that they actually dumped all those files and they didn't. They still were using it during the 2016 election. And from what I understand now, they're still using it. So the question gets to be one about ownership. And it's a really funny question because the users who went on to Facebook, downloaded their application and signed their end user license agreement, basically sold their data to Facebook, right? And even lawyers I know can't really read that rhetoric, but they understand. They gave not just permissible use to Facebook for their data, but explicit use and ownership. Literally, Facebook could resell your data to Cambridge Analytica. Now, they have rules and protocols and business ethics that keep them from doing it, not the least of which is being summoned before Congress and everything else. But the point is they're trying to be, you know, good civil servants and public institutions and, you know, be responsible to all their stakeholders. So they're trying to manage that process. But in theory, they actually own all that data. So the question gets to be one of real self-sovereignty. Who owns your data? What do they own it for? How long do they own it? These are big issues that have not been resolved. And I think that's the next level of discussion debate in the industry. It's funny, this week, two ad industry institutions, first the Advertising Research Foundation, which had their annual conference in New York, announced that they are forming a new group with the American Marketing Association to have a town hall to discuss what are the appropriate and right guidelines for the ad industry to use consumer data to keep it private versus, you know, non-private and how to use and exploit it. And it'll be interesting to see what they develop from that. Just yesterday, the Association of National Advertisers, which is the biggest brand companies in the world, also issued a statement saying something similar. But in that same statement, the ANA went in and pointed out, like, it's kind of funny that they don't even get the transparency from Facebook about the user data that they use to target people. So on the one hand, they're saying, we really want the industry to adhere to consumer privacy standards. On the other hand, they're saying, hey, we'd like to know more about those consumers. And I do think that's the tension in the world. So Mm -hmm. what I would recommend is let's just make it explicit. It doesn't need to be subterfuge and confusion. Yeah, brands and marketers will always figure out ways to persuade you unconsciously, but they should be doing that through their messaging and their creativity and their brand appeals and the utility of their products and services. They shouldn't be doing it by hijacking your own data, your own behaviors, and using it against you. Mm. No, I think you're very right. 
you know, I think of it very simply as kind of the war against scumbags. <laughs> you know, very eloquent. I mean, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, we have since the beginning of marketing, I think, targeted people, right? That's part of the art of marketing and the science of marketing, I should say, is that, you know, certain people are more prone to buy my product. And so I'm going to target them with the right message at the right time, et cetera. But we're just trying to sell a bar of soap. You know, we're trying to get you to buy one more can of soup, whatever that might be. You know, we're not trying to change history <laughs> and change elections, change policies that are going to impact millions and millions of people. Well, but we are. That's part of the industry. Marketing services are not just CPG categories. That's true. They include institutional advertising by businesses to influence legislation or public affairs or public opinion. It includes elections. It includes all those things. The marketing sciences that were developed by the political marketing industry didn't happen in a vacuum and vice versa. Sometimes consumer brand marketers learn things from, look, there's a whole nother level to this thing, which is yeah. always fascinated me over time, which is the overlap between marketing and intelligence community. So, you know, I think the NSA precursor was developed in collaboration with, I don't want to name the name of the name of the agency, but <laughs> after World War II, you know, certain agencies were helping the U.S. with right. propaganda and, you know, information wars back then. And this sounds like I'm going into a deep state thing, but I'm not. <laughs> the point is, this is just marketing science and social science. Right. It's the application of media, data, and persuasion, but it's used in all kinds of funny ways. One of the first people I got to interview when I was a cub reporter at Adweek was Tony Schwartz, the man who literally created the Daisy, you know, first real political persuasion ad for Lyndon Johnson, the Daisy mm. spot. Yeah. And, you know, he had some basic theories about persuasion and unconscious, you know, cues and things. But what's happened is over time, we've kind of accelerated the knowledge of that and begun to use data in ways that people don't understand. And I think that's the danger of the threat. But I do think you know, it's interesting that you have this overlap between intelligence and marketing. And sometimes it's kind of hard to know the difference. If you think about Cambridge Analytica, to use that example, they do work with nation states to influence elections, but also public policies that could overthrow governments and things like that. And how different is that from the NSA versus a uh, leading brand agency? <laughs> it's all uh-huh. about using information about people to persuade people to change how they think, feel, and behave. And that's all it is. Yeah, no, it's very true. Very true. It's a tricky one. We'll have to come back on the show and talk about this more in depth. It's a, it's a whole topic in itself. It is. It is. It's a tricky, it's like a rabbit hole too. We could spend hours, I think, talking you about it. You ever do round tables? We should. We should. That would we be a good one. Round table. Yeah. Well, um, I do want to get to your new company, or I guess it's new. You can qualify that for me. But so tell us about Bitter and what Bitter is trying to do, because it's in this space of self-sovereignty that you talked about, as far as I understand it. Absolutely. Well, it is a new company. It's about four or five years old as a corporation. But the idea and the thesis of, of it has been around as long as I've been thinking about media, which was since I was a kid. But I was lucky enough to become a journalist and cover the media industry from the inside out. So I started to learn how money was made, how you know all this competition for the attention economy wasn't just theoretical. There was a lot of money being made by people on both ends, advertisers, agencies, publishers. And the consumers were getting benefits, like I said earlier, indirectly in the form of free content or underwritten content, or sometimes increasingly utilities, applications, and services. But there was no explicit value exchange. So about the early 2000s or mid 2000s, when I started to see the first development of behavioral targeting and then the emergence of an audience trading marketplace where agencies literally became trading desks and could buy and sell people's attention on open exchanges, just like Wall Street, you know, buying and selling people's identities and their attention in real time off of audience exchanges. I was thinking, well, you know, there's something maybe not unethical about it, but it's definitely not a list. It's illicit. I think people should have more control and sovereignty over their own self. I mean, if you think about what self-sovereign identity is or self-sovereignty, it's literally that you own yourself. And to think that there are times in media and advertising and marketing or the attention economy when we lose ownership of ourselves is kind of a repugnant idea. The fact that I signed an end user license agreement and agreed to the terms and services of Facebook or Google means that they actually own me or a part of me or those fragments of me that end up in their database. Right. Certainly Europe, the European Union and others have you know, gotten up in arms about this and we're going to see a big change hitting 
the U.S. shores too, when the GDPR rules take effect in May. So American companies that think they're isolated from this will be in for a rude awakening when, when those rules hit and there's actual litigation being sued for the theft of people's identity. Now, it might be European Union residents and citizens, but it's still going to impact U.S. companies. So all this is going on in the background. And I'm thinking, well, why do we have to be at war with the consumers as an industry? Why can't we just have an explicit marketplace. So the idea for Bitter came from this notion, if we could just tell a consumer and a brand what the value of that exchange was and let them bid for the consumer's attention directly and create an open, explicit marketplace around it, wouldn't that be a nice world? Now, it's a new world for brands, but the reality is that competing in that world anyway. If you go back to the earliest parts of this conversation when I explained how the number of choice and options was expanding and that brands really need to wake up and understand they're not just competing for consumer attention in a category, but across all these things. Well, that really is the way the world is. And there've been a couple of great platforms that have emerged in the last 20 years to help them get a handle on it. Ironically, they're the same ones who have become the wall gardens, Google and Facebook. And what they've done is they've enabled brands to organize or scale consumer attention amid all of this fragmentation, because they're, like I said, using your identity to target you. So the concept of bidder is basically just to give you sovereignty over that process. So you list yourself on an exchange and you receive bids from brands. In order to get more meaningful bids from brands, you have to tell them something about yourself. It's just like the real world of the equities marketplace. The reason one stock's worth more than another stock on the Wall Street exchanges is because that company did a better job of communicating to investors what the underlying values of that company were today, the intrinsic value and the extrinsic value, but also what the potential earnings would be in the future based on certain assumptions you know, of investment and growth. So it's the same thing with a consumer. We talk a lot about brand equity in Madison Avenue, but we hardly ever talk about consumer equity. So the goal of Bitter is to help brands understand what is the equity of actually reaching a real human being. Alan or Joe or whomever, and to allow Alan or Joe or whomever to send information back to the brand to get even better or, or more valuable bids. The bids could take any form from you know actual cash bids to content, other forms of media credits like they'd done in the old days, you know, subsidizing, underwriting the cost of media. But the truth is brands spend a lot of money in the value exchange with consumers today. Brands spend $1 trillion or more a year winning consumer attention, only half of that goes into advertising. The other half goes below the line in the form of promotions, discounts, samples, giveaways, loyalty, CRM, et cetera. So they're already allocating money directly to the consumer. Some cases, it goes directly into the consumer's pocket in the form of a rebate or a discount. In some cases, it goes to a middleman who basically is getting a commission for bringing that consumer to that product or service. But it's all the same thing. So that's the very high level discussion of Bitter, but I've been okay. told to give an elevator pitch. So the elevator pitch <laughs> is that it's basically Tinder for brands. So it's a dating mm -hmm. app. So the way the application works, and I encourage your listeners to go to www.bid-r.com and download it, or go to Google Play and download the app, and you'll see what it is for yourself. Basically, it's a feed of bids that you're receiving from brands each day. Think of it as an opportunity to date them, just like on Tinder. All the brands really want is a first date with you and the right to earn a second date and ultimately to have a long-term relationship with you. So that's the concept behind it. Nice, nice. So you talk about consumer equity or customer equity, maybe another way to put it as well. How much am I worth? How much is my data worth, do you think? You know, it's funny. I just did an analysis and I published it this morning for Media Post, one of our new publications. And this was tying off a speech that Rashad Tabakawala from Publicis gave about two months ago, where he said, basically, the reason why consumers are leaving ad-supported media and going to Netflix and installing ad blockers is that we're not respecting the value of their time. And he said, we're not even paying them minimum wage. So I said to him, well, let's do the math on that. And over the next two months, and we just published it this morning, we did a back of the envelope analysis and we took all of the aggregate ad spending data that exists in the industry and we divided it by the amount of time that consumers spend paying attention to ad supported media. And it's a funny number. It's $1, $1 per hour. That's how much the industry values your attention to ad supported media. Now, Truth is, they're not paying you $1 in that case. That's ad supported media, they're paying the media. But that's the value in aggregate of reaching an average American consumer per hour of ad supported media. 
what is the, well, it's way less than minimum wage, right? I mean, minimum right. wage, depending on the state, is six, seven, eight, nine, ten dollars $10. So, you know, the real question is, what is the real value for a consumer? And how much of that value should be transferring to the consumer? As I said, brands already transfer a lot of value directly to consumers, but the best value a brand could transfer to the consumer is not an incentive or a promotion or a giveaway. It's creating a product or a service experience that the consumer wants to have a relationship with on an ongoing basis. It should be baked into the cost of goods and services, right? The only reason we do advertising and promotion is to get people to consider, try, maybe come back and try it again, because there is so much choice in the world. But that, in the most explicit sense, is what the value of a consumer's time is. Now, that's not their data. It's funny. We're just about to field a study. We're doing it over the next week, where we're actually asking consumers what they feel the value of their data is. One of the questions is we're asking them, if you could buy your data back from Facebook, would it be worth to you? Things like that. So we're trying to get at it. Of course, that'll be self-reported data. I think it's hard to put a number on data value, but I'll give you one. It's Facebook. So we know Facebook monetizes the average American user to the tune of $8 a month. That's in their public reporting, right? So it's about $100 a year. So one of the proposals that's already been made is, what if Facebook launched a version of Facebook that didn't collect any of your data, didn't serve you any ads, but just let you pay a subscription price to it? Would you pay $100 a year for Facebook that didn't steal your data and didn't target ads to you? I don't know how many consumers would do that. That gets back to the what is the value of the goods and services. I think the truth is we live in a world and a marketplace where there's a spectrum of consumers and they will... Some of them will trade their data and their attention, their time, their behaviors. Some of them don't want to, and we're seeing that already. The ultimate gatekeeper is not Google or Facebook. It's the consumer themselves. Whether they use an ad blocker or simply turn their head away from a magazine or a TV screen, they're exercising their self-sovereignty. I love the platform idea, for sure. And the, the notion of, you've already done some of this analysis, we'll try to link to that in the show notes as well. Why would an agency or a brand want to work with Bitter? What's the rationale? If you well, it's a good question. It's one I've been learning for the past four <laughs> or five years. It's really interesting being a trade reporter, having covered agencies for so long, including the horror stories of vendors pitching agencies. And <laughs> I found myself at five o'clock on a Friday waiting room of an ad agency media department, waiting to take a meeting and sitting across the table from a distressed, overworked agency executive who has seen 10 of those pitches already that day. So it's a real problem for the business. So for... Me personally, I mean, one of the problems is we don't have scale yet. We're still rolling out bitter, but ideally, hopefully from this podcast and other attention getting mechanisms, we'll get more traction and we'll be able to scale it because what brands and agencies really want is scale of reach and audience, which is why Google and Facebook do so well in the world. But what we're really offering people is the opportunity for control and an explicit marketplace, one where both consumers and brands understand the explicit value being exchanged on both sides. So the opportunity for a brand to participate now is learning and real true insight in the world's best laboratory. Because unlike any other app or platform, we don't exist to get people to pay more time and attention to our platform. That's not how we monetize. We monetize by enabling people to hook up with the brands they want and allowing the brands to hook up with them. That's all it is. So we're completely neutral, whether that happens on another platform or on a brand site or in a real world situation at a grocery store or you know in the brand's retail outlet. All we want to do is help brands and consumers pair up with each other. So there's an opportunity to test that and learn. And by the way, you could take those insights and learnings and apply them to your general marketing too. Because one of the problems I think in the world is like, Everybody wants to own you, Google, Facebook, but so does P&G. They want to own you at the exclusion of all the other brands that compete with you. And as I said, increasingly, not just the brands in their categories, but all the other options that are competing for your time and attention. So why not test that in a real world open marketplace where people are considering you versus any other option in the world? So there's one conceit in the bidder format right now, which is we limit the amount of time that any user can trade on it. Any user can only trade up to five minutes a day. And we did that for a few reasons. One is we wanted to create a sense of scarcity and value for the users, but also for the brands competing for your attention. Now, the truth is, as I've said already, there's already a lot of minutes in the day when brands can compete for you in the, quote, real world. So, you know, why five minutes a day on Bitter? Well, it's the only place explicitly where you can engage with a consumer in this kind of open contract. And you can bid for anything. You could bid to serve them an ad impression. That's pretty easy. You could bid 
to get access to specific data that will help inform you as a brand, whether they're really the consumer you want to be in bed with or not. You could use it for product testing or copy testing, any of the things you really want to do in the world. The biggest challenge when I pitch agencies and brands, I think, is when I ask them, I ask three questions. Who do you want to reach? What do you want them to do? And what are you willing to give them to do that? It's that middle question that they struggle with. What do you want them to do? So for a couple hundred years, what we wanted them to do was to look at an ad and then go into a store and buy the product. Well, the world isn't that simple anymore. So sometimes we have to ask people to do lots of intermediation steps to get to that outcome or that funnel or whatever word you want to use. But what we really want to do is understand more about them. And I think there's no better way to understand people's explicit behaviors than in an open marketplace. One of the problems with the world is we rely too much on self-reported data or on behavioral data that's only a snippet or a snapshot of consumers doing something in this one use case, you know, social media or in a e-commerce setting. The difference with Bitter is you can actually engage consumers around anything, real world or digital, and measure the ROI and the return on that, the yield. And we also allow the consumer to do it. And just lastly, one of the things is we let both sides understand what the value of that exchange was. So just like the brand gets to see what the yield or the conversion was of winning a consumer to do the thing they asked them to do. The consumer also gets to see that. And they understand over time which brands value them the most and which brands create the most value for them. And they do it in two ways. One is intrinsic value, which is what is the actual economic value of this bid that I received? You know, was it worth a dollar media credit or $2 in cash or a free sample? But also the extrinsic value. And the extrinsic value is very important to brands and I think consumers too, because extrinsic value is goodwill. It's why you have a relationship with a company, a product, a brand, or a human being that's above and beyond the intrinsic value that was being exchanged with you. That's the intangible. That's the thing that we call brand equity. There was a great presentation by Pete Seely in the early 2000s when he was still the CMO of Coca-Cola. And he did this wonderful presentation at a bunch of industry conferences where he'd get up there and he'd add up all of the fixed assets of Coca-Cola company, the bottling plants, the truckers, the distribution outlets, the secret formula locked up in the safe. And he added it all up. And he computed that it was about half the value of Coca-Cola's then market cap, meaning 50% of Coca-Cola's value was this intangible thing we call brand equity. Now, that's great for a CMO to say, right? Because it just underlies what his value was in the organization. But I think there's some truth there. So the one of the real hopes with Bitter is that we could allow brands and consumers to understand what that goodwill value is. There's reasons I will pay more for a brand, even though the inherent quality of that product or service may be the same as a competitor's. It's because there's something intangible about that brand that just makes me love them. And it might be because they donate to the charities I like, or they boycott the crazy Fox News lady who's, you know, attacking (laughs) the kid from Parkland, right? Right, Whatever it is, that's all part of, you know, why we care or don't care about brands. And I think brands honestly have to start thinking that way about consumers too. You don't want just anyone, right? Now, we know that now because brands are talking about influencers or enthusiasts or ambassadors, right? Mm -hmm. But I also think you have to look at it in a real mathematical sense, which is every potential customer has an intrinsic and an extrinsic value to the brand. But unless you can measure it in a real world marketplace, it's just theoretical. Interesting. So how would an agency or brand reach out to you? Well, it's simply joe at bid-r.com. That's bid-r.com. All right. All right. Well, hopefully we can drive some interest your way. We'll see. And if you have any new scoops, you can always reach me at joe at mediapost.com. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Privacy leaks or uh, any news for that matter, right? We love news. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's important for me. I love getting to know the person behind what we talk about and all the topics we talk about. So I'd love to ask you, is there an experience in your past that you think makes up who you are today? You know, obviously a lot of them, but there was one moment, believe it or not, when I was in junior high school in the seventh grade, going to JHS 135 in the Bronx, and we took two classes. One was called Mass Media, and they gave us Marshall McLuhan's Understanding Media to Read, which is pretty heady stuff for a seventh grader in 1971. And it transformed the way I thought about this thing called media. I didn't really think about it before then. And this idea that 
it was influencing so much of how we think, feel, and behave, blew my mind, literally. But it was the class I was taking next to it called hygiene that kind of really informed how I thought about the world. And you might think, well, hygiene, well, junior high school hygiene, what the heck is that? It was not sex ed per se, but what it was, was two areas of study. One was nutrition. They taught us how to read a nutrition label on the back of a packaged good and understand things like red dye number two and MSG and these horrible chemicals that might be in the product. And then the second thing they taught us was about the ecology. And they gave us Rachel Carson's Silent Spring to read. And that was informing me about things that we were putting into the environment like DDT and other things that were destroying the ecosystem. But the idea of studying media, nutrition, and ecology at the same time just changed the way my brain was wired, I think, because it made me think it's all just data. The data we put in our body informs our physical health or our biological health, right? Our physiology. The data we put in our mind through media informs our mental health or, as we've learned, societal health. Right. And the data we put into our ecology through things like DDT and other chemicals affects our ecological health. But they're all the same thing. And for me, at that point, I started thinking, well, everything is media and media is everything. It just gets to be how you define media and what the data is. So I would say that was my big epiphany and turning point. Man, we need those classes in every school across the country. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just think how much better we would be right now if we had those two courses mandated. I believe there should be media literacy courses in elementary school, because if you think about it, we all talk about peer influence uh, being the most dominant factor of, of kids, well, your family, your peers, and the school system. But there's this other extrinsic thing called media, which is influencing us. And it's the device in your pocket or your hand, as well as the thing you're watching on television or YouTube. So. I don't think we're trained cognitively to think about those things at an early age. And they're really important because they inform the way we evolve, literally. So I first realized this level of, of digital media impact on young people. We all saw the YouTube video with the kid trying to swipe the analog magazine when it was handed to her <laughs> because she thought it was an iPad. You know, it's a really interesting telling thing that we're evolving so quickly because of media. But we're not stepping back and thinking about how it's changing the way we think, feel, and behave. And I think it's really important. And it should start at an early age and just give kids and adults the tools to make better decisions for themselves. Well, what fuels you? What drives you? What keeps you going? Well, it's an extension of that principle I just talked about, which is I chose the path of journalism to enable that thesis. When I get learned about the effect that media was having on me personally and society through that early curriculum. I was like, well, why don't other people know about it? And why don't they do anything about it? And I was trying to figure out at that young age, like, how do I actually apply that knowledge? And so I was thinking, ironically, I could use media to do it. And how do you use media to do it as an individual? Well, one way was to become a journalist. We didn't have digital engineers back then. <laughs> so maybe I would have gone into data science or technology, but I didn't. And I became a journalist. And ironically, I became a journalist who covered the media industry from the inside out, the most crass commercial part of it, how advertising, supply and demand made money for companies and influenced consumers. But it's been a real great education process for me because it's helped me understand that it's not just about media effects. It's also about the business models and the commerce behind them that drive things. To me, one of the most insightful things I learned going back almost 15 years ago, was the role that Silicon Valley and venture capital were playing in this transformation. So, you know, at first, I, I think I was still at Media Post, or I might have been at Ad Age or another place, but I started getting calls from VCs. And I was trying to understand why the VCs were calling me a, an advertising trade journalist. And after the first or second call, I, I kind of got what was going on there. They would tell me about this portfolio company that they had invested in that had built this amazing new widget that will change the world. And they started out with a business model of selling it directly to consumers. And then they realized nobody would actually pay to buy this app or utility or platform, but they were getting a lot of attention and downloads and that could be monetized through advertising. Mm. So I started realizing, oh, I get it. So it's just another form of media that you know brands could use to communicate to consumers. And that's just another monetization model for those technology developers. Well, what I didn't realize was how disruptive advertising monetary chain was to changing the world. Now, we understand it today because of Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, but back then I was like, you know, 
advertising is paying for and underwriting the creation of all this new technology that's changing the way people do and feel and behave through the acceleration of technology. And who's actually doing the guardrails here and thinking about this? So it's funny, I, I spoke about Rashad Tabakawala earlier, but here's another anecdote, which is back then, Publicis, this is about 15 years ago, had a venture capital conference where they had all these VCs come to a meeting in Midtown Manhattan. They invited some journalists and Rashad was in moderating a panel of VCs. And he asked them, what is the most important word to you? A single word. And I remember this VC from Red Point Ventures said, disruption. It was the first time I heard the word disruption used in that way. You know, I knew what it meant. And I kind of understood he meant it in a positive way, but I also understood he meant it in a negative way. That his goal by funding a new business was to disrupt an existing or established marketplace or companies and to create a new market opportunity. But there was another part of that disruption, which is the unintended consequences that disruption would have on society. And it could be good ones, right? It could allow Facebook to connect the world, but it could also be negative ones because it could allow Facebook to disrupt democracies around the world if used improperly. So I think, you know, for me, that's another important insight, which is that the money that goes into it, whether it's venture capital, institutional investors, you name it, has a big effect on which media survive and which ones don't. And that affects our society. So last point on this is really super important if your listeners take anything away. And this is a personal issue for me because I am a journalist. But, you know, Media Plus has been involved with the Wharton School and Bob Garfield for the past five years studying the future of media through various journalism business models. And it's all been off the record. So technically, I can't even talk about it. It's under NDA. And I'm not even sure why we're doing it since it's all off the record, but we're doing it. But I've learned a lot of things from there. And what I'm learning is that the disruptive nature of the media marketplace we've created today and the economic models associated with it are disrupting and displacing very important sources of media for consumers, particularly journalism. Now, yes, yeah. I have a bias on this, but I believe that you know the first step in a democracy is an informed public and that journalism plays a role in it. Not all journalism is good. Consumers, going back to the media literacy point, have to be experts and understand how to read and understand media itself, including journalism. But if it doesn't exist, you can't make those decisions. And the right. problem right now is that the economic models have disrupted that source of information. Thankfully, in the past year and a half, because ironically, President Trump, we've seen a golden age of journalism, right? Where companies like the New York Times and the Washington Post are doing more intrepid reporting than ever. How they're funding it is interesting to me. I mean, obviously in the Washington Post case, you have a benefactor like Jeff Bezos who can subsidize some of this. And in the New York Times case, They've really had to transform as a publishing company to stay in business. And every time President Trump says the failing New York Times, the sad part is he's kind of half right, right? The New York Times right. business model has been challenged. So they've had to adapt. Now, the good news is they're not as reliant on advertising as they used to be. Bad news is they also don't get the subscription revenue they used to get. So they've had to try and create new business models like native advertising or a really interesting, promising one that they're starting to use is a magazine they acquired called Wirecutter where there is no advertising or subscription, and they just get a piece of the revenue from the leads they generate on these product reviews. So I think the point there is that business and economic models have a profound impact on our access to media, the media we consume, and who we are as human beings. And if we don't think about the economic outcomes of these things, we're going to be in perilous state as a species. Well, so stepping back, are there brands or companies or causes that you think other people should take notice of? Well, I don't want to be a one-trick pony here, but I do think the most important thing for humankind is to be informed and to yeah. make intelligent analytical decisions. And I think the biggest threat right now because of technology is this concept of confirmation bias, right? Because we have so much choice available to us, when I grew up, you know, you only had, like I said, a limited number of networks and publishers and newspapers. David Halberstam in his famous book called them The Powers That Be. It was the New York Times, Washington Post, CBS, and Time Magazine. Ironically, Time Magazine may be sold and who knows what will happen to it. And New York Times and Washington Post are may or may not be challenged. And, you know, CBS News isn't what it used to be, but it's still a great institution. I think if I were going to say what causes to Invest in, I would say, journalism. So whether it's subsidizing your own local or national newspapers or radio stations through subscriptions or, in the case of NPR, you know, donations, or if you really want, 
to help fund some of the institutions like Neiman Group or the Trust or any of these organizations that are trying to develop better business models for journalism. I think that would be a good thing too. But, you know, start by subsidizing journalism and media. And by the way, even if you believe more in media that reflect a right wing or more conservative point of view, that's fine too. I think there's room in the world for all of that. But the most important part is that we get a diversity of information in the world so that people can make more informed decisions. Well said. Last question, but this is a doozy, is what do you think the future of marketing holds? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I just had that meeting with Rashad where we talked about, you know, the value of human attention and other things. But the other point he made was he predicted that in the next five years, 30% of the supply of advertising attention would go away, it would just disappear. And it was because of things like the flight to subscription media services, the rise of ad blocking and things like that. And he actually worked through the math of that, and we're going to be publishing that next week in Media Post. But, you know, the point of that is you you would be pretty pessimistic about the future of advertising and marketing, right? right. His title is Chief Growth Officer of Publicis, right? So why would he be out there saying this? Well, the truth is, Rashad's very optimistic about marketing services and marketing, and so am I, when you think about it. Because even though the supply of available attention to consumers is going to diminish over time, what's going to happen is actually the value of it will go up. What will happen is in any supply and demand marketplace, when the supply of inventory goes down, but demand remains constant or grows, the value of it actually increases, right? So I think you will see that. What will happen is value will accrue to the most valuable properties. I think hopefully some of them will be great journalism properties, but any property that can demonstrate that it holds or engages a consumer's attention for brands better than the next guy will win. Right now, it's going to the platforms because they have the best access ethically or unethically to your data, right? They control that. So they can show a brand that you were exposed, that you did this thing, that you converted, blah, blah, blah. But I think in the next wave, what you're going to see is media have to create a genuine effect for the brand to have that value and call it the editorial or the content environment or the principles of the media brand. But I think you're going to see that grow. So I think we'll actually be in a new golden age of marketing. So here's the irony. I start off by saying (laughs) we've gone through this period of hyper fragmentation of media options and marketing and brand choice. Well, I think the number of brands in the world will continue to grow and expand and fragment, but I think the number of great brands reaching consumers will actually diminish. It'll actually go down to a smaller handful of options. And the reason for that is a rule I learned from David Poltrak, the head of research at CBS, something I'd never heard of before was at the beginning of the whole multi-channel explosion, and it's called the magical number seven plus or minus three. And it's this principle of cognition, which is that human beings can only ever process a set number of choices, even with an infinite world or of options, right? We gravitate around things that really are meaningful to us. So the golden age of marketing will become because brands figure out a way to do this thing, to create meaning with consumers for their brands. And they'll do it in a lot of different ways. Some of it will be by buying better media and associating their brands with that content. They'll do it by crafting greater messages. They'll do it by creating better products and services that actually create meaning for your life. But I'm pretty optimistic about the future of marketing. It's not going to be easy to do those things, but the brands who do them will definitely win. They'll win market share and they'll win long-term relationships with consumers. Sage advice. And I, I hope that some of that money, some of that as supply goes down, some of that value does make its way back to quality journalism. So I'm with you on that. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's fascinating. Thank you, Alan. It's been a great opportunity. I appreciate it. Marketing Today is brought to you by Atomic. Atomic focuses on unleashing the growth potential for clients we serve. Atomic is a strategic consultancy specializing in business, marketing, brand, and innovation. Our singular goal is to help you accelerate your efforts with the right mix of expertise, analysis, and creativity. Check us out at atomic.com. A-T-O-M-C-K dot com. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with writing and editing by Kevin Greeley, social media support by Megan Woods, art and graphic design by Sarah Dell. 
If you're new to marketing today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners and you can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes with links to anything we talk about on any episode. You can also search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.